Chapter 9 For the last time, Ma, why don't you think it over? George Kincaid's young voice rasped out angrily at his mother that bent over a dishpan in the kitchen. He leaned in the doorway with a black felt hat pulled low over his thin face, twisted in a discontent scowl. George Kincaid was 19 and he hated the ranch in Powder Valley. Ever since his father had died three years previously, he had tried to urge his mother to sell the ranch and let him go to Denver, where he vaguely planned to enter some sort of business. Miss Dora Kincaid shook her gray head placidly. She was a stout, middle-aged woman with a cheerful, unlined face. Robert Kincaid would turn over in his grave if I was to put a mortgage on this ranch, she told her son. I mind his last words, spoken when he knew he was passing on. He said, Dora, promise me one thing, that you'll keep this ranch going for George to take over when him and Amanda get married. I'll die happy knowing it's waited for him to settle down and raise his young ones just like we raised them. Those were your father's very words, George, and I remember them like they was yesterday. But Manda and I don't want to settle down here on the ranch and raise a family, Ma. She wants to go to Denver just like I do. I don't know whether she'll even have me if I stick around here in Powder Valley. Oh, she'll have you if she loves you, Miss Kincaid told her son. If she doesn't love you, you'd be better off finding it out right now instead of later on. Why are you so stubborn about it, Ma? A thousand dollars is all I needed to get started in Denver. Mr. Arlo would loan us three thousand and you can keep the rest of it and keep on living right here if you wanna. You don't have to sell it, that is. I think you're crazy not to. Why, you could travel all over the world and live in luxury over the eight thousand dollars he'd pay us outright for the place. Dora Kincaid shook her head and kept on washing the supper dishes. I don't want you to have any truck with Mr. Harlow. He's a slick one, son. You mark my words. He's up to no good for this valley. Well, that's all you know about it. He's the best thing that ever happened to us. Why, things are already different since he started loaning money to help folks fix up their ranches. How do you think he made all of his money, Ma? By sitting back and letting the world go by? No, sir, he's up and coming. He's waking the valley up. It did all right for a good many years before he came along. Your pa and I, we were happy here. And you were too until you went off to school and got a lot of silly city ideas in your head. You best get rid of them and start helping me run this place the way your father did. Well, I'm going to see Mr. Harlow in town tonight, George told her sulkingly. There's some sort of meeting at the courthouse and he wants me to come. I told him I'd make one more try to make you see sense, and he said he was just about through holding his offer open, and if we don't want the money, there's others in the valley that do. Well, little credit to them, said his mother tartly. You tell Mr. Harlow I said for him to go on and do anything he wants with his money because we don't want to borrow it, and the Lazy K isn't for sale either. Not for ten times eight thousand dollars. You're just a stick in the mud, George groaned. I don't know what man is going to say when I tell her this. Oh, she'll come around, Miss Kincaid assured him. After you're married, you'll be glad you have a home to bring her to. She just won't do it, Mr. Harlow, said George Kincaid about an hour later in Dutch Springs. I've talked till I'm blue in the face without getting anywhere. Oh, that's too bad for you, Eustace Arlo shrugged his heavy shoulders. Well, as I told you, I can't hold my offer open forever. I'll take my money where it's wanted. He turned away abruptly to go towards a group of men that loitered on the courthouse lawn, and George Kane Cade stared after him miserably. There went his last chance to get away from Powder Valley to the city where he could be a gentleman. A furious sense of frustration took a hold of him. He didn't see why his mother had to be so stubborn about it. It wouldn't hurt anyone to borrow a little money. What was so terrible about putting a mortgage on the ranch? 
A lot of other people did, and the world didn't come to an end. His shoulders slumped wretchedly, and he felt very sorry for himself. He went over to one of the kegs of beer and stayed there until the men filed inside the courthouse to open the meeting that resulted in Pat Stevens' resignation as sheriff of Powder Valley. He went in behind the others and slumped down on the bench in the last row and paid little attention to what went on. He left when the others did and silently followed a group of them to the Gold Eagle where he drank numerous glasses of whiskey on top of the free beer he had poured down before the meeting. He witnessed Pat's capitulation to Harlow and Trippo and the subsequent jailing of Big One-Eyed Ezra. He stayed on at the Gold Eagle, slumped laxly against the bar with his hat pulled low over his sullen eyes while he grew angrier and angrier at his mother and her refusal to help him get away to the city. After midnight, the bartender refused to serve him any more, because of his youth and because he had had enough. But George was too miserable to care, and he stayed on at the saloon until the new sheriff's two deputies came into the saloon cursing lurdly about Ezra's escape from jail. George stumbled out and mounted his horse to ride home soon after that. He was sober enough to stay in the saddle with loose rein and let his horse pick his way home, but he was drunk enough to feel utterly and completely sorry for himself. He was dozing in the saddle in a wretched state of self-pity when he reached the Lazy K Ranch sometime after midnight. A couple hundred yards from the dark ranch house, the road led through a wire gate that had always been kept closed. George roused himself enough at that point to note that with some security that the gate was now open. He knew he had closed it when he rode out to Dutch Springs earlier in the evening. None of the other Lazy K raiders had followed him to town and he didn't understand why it was now open. He checked his horse subconsciously as he rode through the gate, instinctively meaning to get down and close it behind him. Just as he started to swing his right leg back over the saddle, he heard the loud, clear crash of a forty-five up ahead at the dark ranch house where his mother was sleeping. His horse tensed and pricked his ears forward. George remained as though petrified and half out of the saddle, his weight resting on his left foot in the stirrup, hands tightly on the pommel. While he stared ahead through the night and tried to think what the sound could have been other than a gunshot. For he knew it couldn't have been a gunshot. He knew his mother was up there in the house alone and she had a deadly fear of guns. Then he heard the loud drumming of a horse's galloping hooves rapidly drawn towards him. He slid back into the saddle and gripped the reins and stared through the night with blurred eyes. A horseman emerged from the darkness and thundered towards him. George's horse pranced nervously, and the boy tightened the reins. The galloping figure dashed past him and through the open gate and continued on from the ranch with an undiminished speed. George caught only a fleeting glimpse of the rider in the faint moonlight, but that simple glimpse was enough. He saw a bulky figure in red whiskers and a single eye that glared at him menacingly as it sped past, and he saw enough to swear it was Ezra, who had killed his mother after he rode on up to the house and found her body laying in her blood-soaked bed. When his testimony was added to that of Ethan Jr. and of Jose, it was quite enough to convince the strongest doubters that Ezra was the victim of a homicidal mania that had taken four lives in the span of a few hours. End of chapter 9